Hello and welcome to the 17th session of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution Reading Group series. Today we are on to the final chapter of our book, Chapter 17, Final Considerations. Okay, does anybody want to put up a hand and take this first section here? A, the progress in our class goal. Slavic. Chapter 17, Final Considerations. A, the progress in our class goal. In the previous chapters, we have briefly presented the basic principles of communist operational life. We have shown what free and equal producers are what the abolition of money, the market, and wage labor means. We have seen what it means that communist enterprises know no real income and expenditure, no assets and no debts, and we have also shown the new legal relations for the building of communism. So, we as workers have grown very much in self-confidence, because if you look at things more closely, it becomes clear that the workers themselves never came up with the communist objective. So far, the working class has followed in the wake of intellectuals and officials who view communism from their own interests. Although they speak of social revolution that will create new social relations, these are immediately new legal relations, however, they stubbornly refuse to develop these new legal relations further. This is perfectly understandable. In their train of thought, they will be the ones who will have to take over the actual management of operational life. From their point of view, therefore, a closer look at the laws of movement of communism, the abolition of wage labor, is completely unnecessary, even harmful. It is no coincidence, then, that these basic principles, which look at communism precisely from the point of view of the wage laborer, were born from the heart of the proletariat. As ordinary proletarians who normally do the dirty work, we have wondered how the interests of our class are safeguarded. Therefore, we have not been content with the formula that the social revolution creates new legal relations, but we will determine the content of these new relations ourselves. It goes without saying that the socialism of intellectuals will contradict these views. B. From the money account to the working time account. The extent to which the working class will be able to break this resistance cannot be further investigated at present, which is why we leave this question alone. We must, however, say a word about the transition from the capitalist money calculation to the working time calculation. How is money abolished? How is operational life transferred to the working time calculation? To shed light on this issue, we shall apply the usual method examining what the practice of capitalism has already taught us in this area. So, we will not invent a solution, but we will ask a question to history. In fact, we have already received practical lessons since several countries began to introduce a new unit of account after the war. As is well known, most countries experience enormous inflation after the war, Russia and the European states obtained the necessary state money by having more and more paper money printed, as a result of which the value of the money decreased from day to day, i.e. the prices of the products increased every day. The whole economic life was more and more disturbed, and finally the money had become completely worthless in some countries. In this situation, it was necessary to stabilize the value of money which was done by introducing a new unit of account. For example, Russia got its Chernovats instead of the old ruble, Germany got its goldmark, Austria its shilling, Belgium its belga. Above all, Germany gave visual instruction on the introduction of a new unit of account. Here it was simply stated that from a certain date on, a trillion paper stamps would be equal to the value of a gold mark. Social life adapted wonderfully to this largest and most difficult financial operation ever attempted, the new statesman. Uh, certainly this expropriated several thousand small owners, but big business was saved and the economy was able to get back on track with its calculations. In the case of a proletarian revolution, the same phenomena will undoubtedly be repeated. 
in its first period of existence, the proletarian dictatorship needs an enormous amount of money, which it has to obtain through the banknote press, like the capitalist states from 1918 to 1923. For the proletariat, however, this is not a means of abolishing money in order to enter into a moneyless society, as the Russians believed. Surely, a council government would want to avoid as far as possible the scourge of inflation, which hits the working class above all. But there is no choice. Whatever the course of the revolution, whether it leads to state communism or the association of free and equal producers, whether a party succeeds in usurping the dictatorship or the proletarian class as such, exercise it through its councils, in any case, inflation will occur. As a result, the already disrupted operational life would come to a complete standstill, so that the working class is faced with the question of, quote, stabilization. With the introduction of a new unit of account, if the working class lacks the strength to implement communism, a new currency, a new kind of money will be created. When the workers have so much control over the operational units that they can abolish wage labor, then they will move towards the abolition of money by introducing working hours as the unit of account. The conversion of money into working hours will then be done in the same way as in the past, the conversion of paper marks into gold marks. It is a simple operation that anyone can perform and that all operational organizations can use to calculate the production time for their product. Okay, so there's a couple of bits here. So kind of talking about how the workers themselves never came up with a communist objective, that it was really, things were really much left in the hands of the, you know, party apparatchiks and the, the theorists at the high end. And he talks about how they never developed these new legal relations to the extent that we're doing in this book. Let me see what he says here. It is no coincidence then that these basic principles, which look at communism precisely from the point of view of the wage labor were born from the heart of the proletariat. As ordinary proles who normally do all the dirty work, we have wondered how the interests of our class are safeguarded. Therefore, we have not been content with the formula that the social revolution creates new legal relations, but we will determine the content of these new relations ourselves. It goes without saying that the socialism of intellectuals will contradict these views. So we kind of making this like kind of, historical materialist argument about where this stuff for labor time accounting and these new legal conditions come from. Okay, let's go on to the second bit here. People are, don't have much to say about this. So the second part here is about from the money account to the working time account. So he's talking about the experience of the post-World War I economies and the revolutions and stuff like that, where there was a lot of inflation and a lot of destabilization of currencies. And how these currencies were essentially, new currencies were introduced by basic resetting of the old currency at a new amount. I, I think it's probably something, there's probably more to it than just a simple equation like that, as in from just an economic point of view, you can imagine that like the hyperinflation in Germany, which had so much to do with reparations and the inability of Germany to produce enough exports to get the foreign currency like so it's not just simply a thing of saying let's let like one trillion deutschmark equal one geldmark or whatever it's it's more to do also with production relations but the technical thing of changing the unit of account is something that can be done and has been done you know i was in i think i was in venezuela when they were just about to do it back in like to 2000 or something like that you know when i'd go to the shop i would literally have you'd have wads of cash and it might only be worth a dollar i you know it was it was kind of crazy i think i might have had both currencies the old ones that were worth like ten thousand or a hundred thousand of the new ones it seems like this element is perhaps somewhat over simplifying what's involved as in it is not purely just a case of just changing like a denominator or like their exchange ratio. But it seems that at every point, how things are recorded throughout the economy need to be recorded in terms of labor time. 
that would make it a kind of an order of a more complex switch. Any comments? Alan? Maybe I'm uh, oversimplifying in the way I'm thinking about it, but I wonder, do we really need to worry about like this kind of converting money to to labor time accounting like can't could the could the labor time economy kind of exist in parallel with the you know the existing capitalist economy and no conversion is necessary it's just the the labor time economy is kind of self-contained and it can it can grow on its own terms maybe yeah, I, I I personally don't think so. I think there's been lots of various labor time accounting schemes that have been tried in different places, and they are kind of peripheral to the real operations of of society. It would seem that you need a revolutionary change to to put them in. I would also say that you, like you definitely need to have the conversion done because you need to be able to account for the the labor time of existing fixed capital and raw materials to make good calculations. So you would also need a conversion from the previous unit to the current unit and not just starting off anew with the new unit. Kilcha. Yeah, I've got to say, with this section is where I fall off the wagon hard with this book. Um, it just doesn't work for me. Uh, this idea that you can have a crisis and then at that point of crisis, you can avoid doing the, the simpler thing, which is introducing a new money accounting standard and completely switch not just to a new a new measure of accounting but also as far as i'm concerned to an entirely new way of organizing society of running the economy all of these things which are much much harder than just changing the units of account and this is the point where you, where the economy is at its 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 highest crisis point so to me it feels like the, the very people who need to make that decision to switch are the people who are least empowered to do so because they they're going to be there's going to be food shortages there's going to be riots there's going to be everything's going to be crazy it just doesn't feel viable. If we can't introduce this more gradually, I don't, I don't see how sort of our own version of what's known any climate, call it the shock doctrine, is, is going to work to introduce this form of communism. Yeah, like I think they've kind of uh, undersold the complexity of the task. You know, from my point of view, Kielce, like when I think about it, I think like we're going to see it now in the next little bit, but like there is the ability like from, I don't know how, how many people know of like, from our study of the TSSI, there is the concept of the melt, the monetary equivalent of labor time. And that's something that's pretty easy to calculate, like from the existing, you know, books from the capitalist books of the the economy, you can have a, it's like the monetary equivalent of the labor time. So one hour of labor is equal to today, $23.97 or something like that. Like that, that actual Ratio thing is the easiest part. Like that's where I, I totally agree with you, Kilt. I think like the introduction of the system whereby you have different councils organizing the planning, the conversion of software towards uh, labor time accounting and all that stuff. To me, that's a three to five year plan that needs to be pushed, you know, pushed out in society. It's like the re it's like the introduction of the euro or something. It's not a, a thing you just go overnight and say oh yeah, the, the punt is equal to 20, 1 euro 27 and the Italian lira is equal to this. I think it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger thing and I think they are fundamentally underselling this aspect here. I, I, I see the introduction of labour time as a thing not in, in essence done at the moment in the worst parts of the revolution, but like once the revolution is won and there's a dictatorship with the proletariat, the plan for introduction of labor time is a process that gets enacted. That's the way I view it. I think I agree with Kielce. I think it would be kind of an order of magnitude more difficult thing than just the switching of the the currency, like the the, the Gelt or the Deutschmark to the Geldmark. Okay, Emil. Yeah, well, there's, I agree uh, that that is uh, <laughs> troublesome to uh, change this kind of level of of how the economy works in a Basically, civil war. <laughs> Whenever you take power, but on the other hand, you need the level of political influence. You need to take power as a working class to be able to implement it in the first place. So there's a contradiction going on there. Uh, so the logical consequence would then be that there would be a period in which the dictatorship of the proletariat would involve managing the old economy. Yeah? So man managing the old 
uh, having wage labor, having uh, wage extraction, all the troublesome big bits that this book is uh, criticizing uh, about uh, against the um, social democratic uh, leaders and the Bolsheviks. But what I was thinking is that uh, there can be some preparation of this kind of implementation by indexing the economy as it uh, is now. And, and this also involves having actually big workers' organizations to be able to index how much time, how labor time it, it'll cost to make steel or whatever. And so go through the whole through the whole process of, of uh, how much time everything costs to have an idea of what kind of numbers to implement when, when our time is coming. Not sure if that is making sense, but I don't think that it is as easy as saying, okay, one euro or one dollar or whatever it is, is so much labor time because the capitalist economy is not working in the same sense as a labor time economy would be. So I'm not sure if there's a one-to-one -one ratio in that sense, if, if that is making any sense there. Yeah, like one thing I would say, though, like uh, with your first point about the criticizing the, you know, the, the point the book is making of criticizing, say, the Bolshevik method or the anarchist uh, idea or, or whatever for the lack of labor time planning. I think, though, that there's a kind of a different quality to this transitional period, that the transitional period is a, a stabilization to like a short one to implement this thing that will fundamentally change society in a way that the the Bolsheviks never talked about. So I think there's a kind of a a quantity and quality kind of relationship or something going on there. I think the indexing is an interesting thing. Yeah, like I think that that type of stuff. I think more so. I think the difficulty I would say is not so much in indexing because honestly, you can figure out probably good. From literally a base point of using the the, the melts, the monetary equivalent of labor time, you can pretty much come up with reasonable prices in labor time accounting for that would 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 work generally and would converge to something good over time. But what you don't have is the actual the structure of the councils and how they interact to do with planning and all that stuff. Like that is a complete societal reorganization of a complete different order that I see as the you know, the biggest element to this, Slavic. I guess I'm still a little bit confused by, because my understanding is you wouldn't institute this switch over to working time unless the councils literally had the the power. Like, I'm not sure why exactly there would need to be a, like anywhere there are councils, they would institute that sort of labor time accounting. I'm not really sure why if if they don't have the power to actually enforce that working uh labor time accounting in the same way that if the government does a doesn't have the power to switch the currency then they can't do that right they're just saying that okay if we have the power to do it it's just a matter of a simple switch over and you know if you have things like melt that you can use to make those calculations then once you set the basis up for that, once you set the basis for working time, then that organization will come out of it. Isn't that kind of the premise of the book? Yeah, but like, let's say, imagine what we're going to say, we're going to make a decision with respect to accumulation funds, right? Where are accumulation funds going to go? Who's going to get them? How do we decide? Yeah. So let's say in the morning, everybody changes over all the individual ones as they're taken over by the workers. They change into labor time accounting and now they sell their goods and labor hours and they receive it. And let's say then society as a whole, how does society as a whole make make the decision with respect to what is that accumulation thing? How does that filter down to the shoemaker and the and the massage parlor and the, you know, the, the cinema and all of this type of stuff like that whole that whole middle layer of logic that's not a fundamental principle that has to be that has to be embedded that has to be put into operation or else what you'll get is i just think you'll get chaos but certainly you need to have the basis of that working time calculation to even discuss how like where that money's going to go right but i think you already like like just even by using the melt as a basic thing you already have a, an understanding of the economy's labor time function. But what you don't have is the literal council system embedded and planned so that people understand 
how it operates, where they interact with each other, what how the decisions get made, like in a way that people all think is good, that the, the system is designed to be responsive. Uh, you know, that that level of stuff, like maybe a a, a really good communist uh, movement can theorize and can get people on board with what it's going to be and how we're going to do it from day one and that we have prefigurative examples that we we use and that it's it's easier than say i'm making out but like even just sorting out the it problems like you know when you look at like <laughs> the y2k problem yeah some of you are probably too young you're probably in nappies when the y2k problem was an actual live issue right but the y2k thing came along like that was just changing a few digits and that caused fucking loads of it shenanigans you know so actually trying to implement the thing so that it's not a disaster and you don't get rolled back in the wrong direction i think is a a fundamental issue here that the book here i think is skipping over a bit i'm on kilcha's side with this kilcha hand up i was just going to say that that's a good point about you'd hope that you'd have workers councils in in most organizations already but i can't see you'd have it universally and i and i think also, it's it's hard to see how you'd have much practice at sort of the interrelationship between different firms at this point, and that's the bit that's critical for switching over. And I just think people naturally just aren't going to be brave enough to flip the switch and try a, you know entirely new system straight away. They'd, it, it's just too risky. You'd want to unless we're forced into it because you're in a revolutionary situation which has all its own problems. I just think that if if it's possible to have a way to try it out first, that's that's got to be. Even if it's some sectors of the economy, you just or you know if it's just like some sort of like way of just just gaming out how it would work for the people, you want to plan it in, in that way. And take and thinking again of the all the p- interviews people have been having about shock therapy, China book that's been doing the rounds on all the podcasts recently, and how they were umming and erring about switching back to capitalism, and they were having very similar discussions. And 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 uh, it it just doesn't seem just doesn't seem viable that people would would choose to to flip the switch and and, and complete a new system. Like you could imagine, you know, along the lines of what you're saying, Kilcha is like, you know, that you have like sectors that are like trial sectors, like that you you pick, say, steel, and you say, here's how the steel sector has been doing it, and we we've trialed, we've got our you know our our different layer of councils deciding, you know, how the the firms themselves interoperate, how this receives accumulation funds, how that's decided, and we can see how it's operating and. We, And then you could also imagine like, you know, stages of, you know, maybe switching over from from what is existing into as a as a unit, you know, like you see how they they bring a a large infrastructure project, like, say, the Crossrail here in London. It's the biggest infrastructure thing in, I think, in Europe at the moment. And it's like how you integrate like, you know, a new train line into like a crazily badly designed thing like the the london underground that's a hodgepodge of like trains systems over the last 200 years and it's like you know about integrating this you know that you can imagine that like as a just as a as a project management thing it is a is a it is a behem is a behemoth of a thing to do but i would say though going a little bit against what you said kilcher like you could imagine though that if if this was ever to be a reality that you get to a stage where this kind of idea of council, this political economy we're talking about is getting introduced that by definition, I think you would have to have essentially, you know, a majority probably, and that majority would exist in in practically all industries, bar the ones that are likely to be shut down, like ones like more like banking and maybe the military and stuff like that (laughs) are advertising. Slavic. Yeah, I I guess that's part of, that's part of what I'm thinking is like, in order to even conceive of switching over, like you already have to have the power, like already have to have widespread councils and or Soviets or what have you already in place to even do this switch. So by that fact, I would assume that councils already have some degree of coordination with each other in order to have achieved that power in the first place. And then it's a matter of just like, yeah, perhaps along with switching over the currency, you also set up, you know, monthly, yearly congresses to evaluate things, you know. I think you can set up that structure as you switch over. But that 
the problem is like how do the councils get that power right like that's the political issue really donald in the chat says that the producers would need to be associated into guilds too you know prior to labor time accounting you know like so i think that's just an example of one of the kind of levels of kind of a of of layers of things that need to be formally structured and to be functioning before you could even hope to bring in a thing like this and like the whole thing is like you don't want to do it wrong you don't want to bring it in and it's such an amazing fuck up like the introduction of a you know a, a unitless accounting system that the soviets did in physical quantities that you just have to revert like uh, if that's the case you know if you if it if it ends up that we we make you make a balls of it and you have to revert back to a monetary thing, you fucked it up for the next historical cycle, and maybe worse, people will never go back to it. So I do think they undersell it a bit here. We'll be going to see. We're going to. I think we'll do C here. Maybe somebody else will have a read. See here, we're going to get into kind of a crude way they they have talked about perhaps getting towards this concept of the melt. You know, it's essentially. What they're getting at here anybody put a troy hand up there and do a bit of reading randy c the key number of course it is difficult to determine exactly how many working hours correspond to one guilder for example we cannot arbitrarily assume that one guilder corresponds to one hour or two hours of work that is why the figure must be calculated as accurately as possible it is therefore necessary to check how long the production time for a particular product has lasted the best industries for such calculations are those that supply a mass product such as coal, electricity, iron, or potassium. From the operational books, it is possible to see how many tons of product were produced in a given time, what the actual cost was. From this, if one emits interest on capital, etc., it is possible to determine how many working hours were used. From this data, the monetary value can be calculated for an iron hour, coal hour, or potash hour, after which the average of all of these industries can be taken as a provisional general average. If this average turns out to be 80 cents of a dollar for one working hour, then each operational unit can calculate a provisional production time for its product. It is now possible in all operational units to convert the total stock into working hours by multiplying all monetary amounts expressed in marks by one and a quarter. This figure is the key figure. The calculation of a shoe company would therefore be read. F equals use tools, buildings, etc. Mark 1000 equals 1250 working hours. C equals leather and so on. Mark 49000 equals 61,250 working hours. L equals working hours 62,500. F plus C plus L are 125,000 working hours. According to our previous assumption, 40,000 pairs of shoes were produced, so that average production time is 3.125 hours per pair of shoes. We are not saying that the key numbers or index has to be found in the above-mentioned way. We are just saying that it can be found in this way. There are many ways to reach the goal. It is not possible to calculate the first key number exactly. We can only try to estimate it as accurately as possible. As soon as the calculation has been generally implemented, the actual production times are displayed very quickly. Okay. What they're getting to here in the last section is like, you know, there are many ways you could go about this. I think probably the approach of the melt could probably be the way that would be most accurate, which would be look at the total production in the economy, you know, and the total monetary amount. And you'll have the number of labor hours. And then you can just do a quick calculation there, something that's kind of in the Marxist economic literature now for the last 20 years, I think, as a pretty easy thing to be able to be done. You know, so the the melt itself might be slightly out. You know, there are problems with how you can probably accounting problems and all that. But the the problem is at the start. You know, what you know at the start we are trying to essentially labor time get labor time estimates for existing stocks of material and fixed capital. You know, and they might be slightly out or whatever. And but you know, if our equations are if our estimates are out. These can be like recalculated reasonably easy. Like if your fixed capital lasts longer than you expected, you know you might find out that oh, we didn't give it enough value, uh, or or equivalently with the raw materials. So that's the general problem of of getting the index. You know, which I think is not a problem whatsoever. Like nowadays, it's not an issue. It's just it's kind of like a a solved problem. The big work is this other stuff that 
Kielce is pointing towards. I, I was just wondering if anybody knew if we're, we're sort of for war economies like America, USA during World War Two, whether they actually employed this sort of uh, accounting uh, for, for, for planning war production. It's interesting you say that because I... Uh... I think even the the UK economy do it sometimes now. Did they have in the UK? They were wondering about whether they would be able to build a couple of new aircraft carriers, and they essentially did this type of kind of planning, like how many skilled laborers do we have? You know, what is our steel inputs? How would it affect other things? So I think they do use kind of labor time planning to some extent when they want to do these things, and I can imagine in wartime they probably did that. Yeah, I, I think there was like some big report done about the British trying to build their aircraft carriers. I think they might have found out they didn't have the capacity to even build them. Emil? Well, actually, I read a recent article in, in Dutch on uh, the costs of uh, building nuclear power plants. And the, it was based on a um, report by the KPMG, the accountancy firm. And they were actually measuring it in labor years. So it would cost 12,000 labor years to build a modern nuclear power plant, <laughs> something according to those lines. So yeah, it's, it is apparently being used, at least in accountancy, for accountancy purposes. Uh, it's just an unknown concept. Yeah, the accountants have no problems with labor time, uh, theory, labor theory of value. <laughs> you know, this is like, I've, I've, like, I have an interview I probably planned sometime to do with like some accountancy guy in here in one of the big London like colleges you know and you, you do find in the business schools they are m much more amenable to labor time and Marx's theories than the economics departments you know the the remaining kind of Marxist economists tend to be that are in, in academia like a lot of them are actually to be found in or, or at least proponents of Marxist economics are in the business schools yeah they're not surprised at all Emil okay Randy let's hit section D D. Utopism. With this, we certainly want to conclude our study for the time being. Certainly, the subject is not exhausted, but we do not want more than to put the discussion about communism on a new basis in order to achieve a common proletarian goal in the labor movement. To deepen this discussion, we pointed out the utopian character of the constructions of socialism as we know them in Cole's Guild Socialism and the Socialization Reports. One does projects on how to organize the different industries, how to abolish the opposition between producer and consumer through certain commissions and councils, through which the organs, the power of the state should be tamed, etc. If such an author gets into a jam with his fantastic somersaults, a difficulty arises in his theoretical considerations regarding the cooperation of the different industries. The solution is soon there. A new commission or special council will be brought into being. This is especially true of Cole's Guild Socialism which makes that all of these considerations are just nonsense. The organizational structure of the production and distribution apparatus is functionally linked to the economic laws according to which it moves. All considerations of this construction are utopian its stuff as long as the economic categories that are the basis of this construction are not represented. It is utopia and distracts attention from the fundamental problems. In our considerations, we have consistently adhered to the economic laws. As far as the organizational structure is concerned, we only referred to the operational organizations and cooperatives. We were entitled to do so because history has already indicated these forms. We have treated the organization of farmers with the greatest restraint precisely because Western Europe has very little experience in this area. That is why we only showed how capitalism has developed the conditions for calculating the socially average production time of products. We did not go into too much detail in further organizational development. How the organizations of the operational units connect, the organs they create for the smooth course of productions, these are all problems which are determined by the special conditions and, therefore, cannot be examined in advance. Okay, I would like to push back a little bit on that last section. Okay, this is the idea that how the organizations of operation units connect, the organs they create for the smooth course of production, these are all problems which are determined by the special conditions and, therefore, cannot be examined in advance. Like, I, I do think that there's quite a lot of learnings to be had from kind of cybernetics and the study of social organizations. So I, I think that they are entirely correct for me, like on the focus on the fundamental principles. But I don't think that, that there cannot also be work done on 
analyzing the the problems of organization and the types of organizations that would facilitate these basic economic fundamental principles. Anybody have any discussion on this last section? Uh, Slavic. Without being as critiqued as utopianism, but I suppose the next level would be to talk about what those social organizations would look like and how they would function. But they're saying, they're, am I correct to say that they're thinking that that kind of stuff would be utopianism? Uh, I'm like wondering what kind of conditions are so wildly different that you know that you can't suppose some of those things like for example is weather and climate uh, are those the factors that are what's making it so difficult that you can't presume some of that in advance i don't know i presume it's more social kind of relations than kind of environmental conditions you know like political social relations alan yeah i wonder uh, maybe you talks about special conditions or something and maybe that's in reference to the 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 you know proper form of organization is going to be specific to kind of each branch of production or like you know the organization of a nuclear power plant is going to be different from you know whatever a, a an organic farm or or what have you so it's maybe they're just saying it's useless to try to prescribe that in advance when you could just kind of leave it to the whatever is natural to that actual branch of production. Yeah, like I, I personally would push back on that. Like I think from reading and looking at the Stafford Beer stuff is like that, you know, this idea of a, a, a VSM, a, what, oh God, what does VSM stand for? The uh, Bible Systems Model, like that the, the, org- the structure of the organizations and how they interact should be self-similar at different scales. So I think there is definitely a uh, work to be done there like i think they're making the argument that against this like cole's guild social and whatever the hell that is i've never i've never heard of cole's guild socialism but like against this idea of kind of abstractly designing a council to deal with this problem and another one to do this one and it's all just like l- layers of councils describing like the operation without the fundamentals is a proper critique of that but to say that you only need the fundamentals without to work on the the ideas and the the, the the knowledge we have from capitalism itself about the operational structure and function of organizations, to me, is an argument I don't think that holds water. Like, I, I think that if you were to try and implement them, I think this problem is, I think, again, here in this section, they're understating the, the, the problem of, of implementation. I, I, I think they're saying that it'll all come out in the wash. I, I think there is lots of preparatory work and lots of scientific investigation into organizations that will help the fundamental principles to operate in a way that will lead to a communist society. Okay, now who wants to read the next section there? Hands up. Patrick. E summary. Let us summarize our considerations briefly. And the following picture emerges. The basis of the studies is the empirical fact that when power is taken over, the means of production are in the hands of the operational organizations. The strength of the communist mentality, which again is related to the clear understanding of what to do with the means of production, will determine whether they will keep them. But if they do not keep them, they will go to state communism, which cannot abolish wage labor. If they keep the means of production, then they cannot order production and consumption in any other way than based on the socially average production time with the abolition of money. It is also possible that there are such strong syndicalist tendencies that the workers want to try to make the operational units into their own management, to regard them as their property in order to to distribute the full proceeds of labor among the employees of the unit. This kind of communism cannot abolish money and leads from guild socialism to state capitalism. In our view, the main focus of the proletarian revolution is to establish an exact relationship between the producer and the product. And this is is only possible if the calculation of working hours in production and consumption is carried out on all sides. It is the highest demand the proletariat can make but at the same time, it is also the lowest. 
it is a decisive question of power which the proletariat has to fight through on its own because under no circumstances can it count on the help of other social groups. The assertion of the operational organizations thus refers to independent administration and management. This, therefore, the only basis on which the calculation of working hours can really be carried out. A veritable stream of literature from America, England, and Germany provides evidence of how the calculation of the average social production time is prepared by capitalism. The modern cost accounting in communism, the calculation of F plus C plus L goes just as well now, only with a different unit of account. In this respect, the old capitalist society carries the new communist one in its womb. In communism, the counting between operational units will, will go through the general social accounting, through the Jiro office, just as in capitalism. Here too, capitalism gives birth to the new order. The consolidation of operational units is a process that is still taking place today. Future groupings will probably be different because it is based on different criteria. The operational units, which we call the GSW type, the so-called public operations, will be modeled as communist branches of the industry that exist today, but function as instruments of the class state, detached from the state and integrated into society. There will still be a state because the bourgeoisie has been defeated, but it has not yet disappeared. But the state will then be clearly visible to all as the organ of repression of counter-revolution. But it will have nothing to do with production or distribution. Here, at the same time, the conditions will be present under which the state can actually die. Tearing away the public operational unit from the state their insertion into the economic whole requires the identification of the part of the social product, which still needs to be distributed individually, for which we find the uh, factor of the individual consumption. If we oppose this to state communism or state capitalism here, it becomes immediately clear that in the latter, there can be no exact relationship between the producer and the social product. The worker is a state worker and receives his wage from the state. The collective agreements with the unions determine the amount of this wage. The administration of the product is in the hands of the state bureaucracy, whereby the producers are guaranteed workers' participation by the unions. Democracy thus becomes the cover behind which, as under capitalism, the real control of millions is hidden exactly as in capitalism. Okay, thanks for that, Patrick. Now, quite a bit to chew on here in this summary. Yeah. Let me go back up here now. A line here, the strength of the communist mentality, which again is related to the clear understanding of what to do with the means of production, will determine whether they will keep them. Okay, and I think that's kind of a self-evident truth. Like, we did not see in the German Revolution or in the Russian Revolution a strong enough communist mentality. I assume the same in the in the Chinese Revolution, which I'm not as au fait with. So this is this is the task of a communist party or a communist organizational form is to get the communists get people to understand what is the most important aspects of of the movement, and this being, I think, the core underlying fundamental principles of what's going to be that new society that has got to be like drummed into everybody's goddamn head and everybody's got to understand that what the basic outline has to be now he goes on to talk a little bit here about syndicalist tendencies where operational units want to like regard the factory as their own this kind of communism cannot abolish money and leads from guild socialism to state capitalism I don't know, that's a kind of a, for me, I think that's a bit of a strong statement, as in like, I could imagine, you know, the problems that emerge, like from a syndicalist type of thing can lead to other bastardized kind of capitalist forms, as a, not necessarily to say that it's going to lead to the state capitalist forms we've seen in the USSR, uh, inverted commas state capitalism, I know it's controversial over that. So I think that sentence there, they're kind of, um, 
they're they're bending the stick a wee bit to put it in a kind of a Leninist way. What do people make of this? This line, I think, is a great way to, to put it. Talking about the labor time calculation, it is the highest demand the proletariat can make, but at the same time, it is also the lowest. Anybody have any comments? Emil? Well, regarding the, the guilt socialism uh, comment, I think that's a callback to the earlier critique in the book regarding libertarian socialism and, and, and anarcho-syndicalism and stuff like that. I think that's a pretty obvious reference to that. Yeah, that is fair. But like to call that state capitalism is another step, isn't it? Well, the point of that critique at that time in chapter three or something, I, I've lost the word was, but uh, was that it was going to refer back to capitalist forms of uh, production, uh, of, of value production. And that's that's a problem. <laughs> that is, yeah. But I suppose I'm making the point that you could have different bastardized capitalist forms. And to call them all state capitalism, like could be kind of lumping different types of mm. bastardized forms yeah. in under that same one moniker, which might be somewhat crude. That's kind I of do agree there. And and that's the problem I have with this book calling the Soviet Union state capitalism. Not sure if that's a correct term for that. It was more or less a thing on its own, I believe. But yeah lumping it all together to to say, well, state capitalism is a bad society or something like that. It's not not really scientific, I think. Slavic. Yeah, so I kind of, I was a little surprised with the way they define the state, which they kind of kept to, because earlier, previous chapters, they said, okay, the state isn't some sort of porcelain thing that you can just smash, right? It's it's not just like a, a vessel. And so they, they say that, you know, we need to take away their involvement in production and distribution. We need to take those roles away from the state in order for there to be communism. So at that point, I don't really see why I hold that definition of a state, because I think in opposition to Lenin's conception, which it is kind of like a vessel, you see the state as a social relationship. And so once you remove the capital labor relationship, then it's not really a state, even if there's like an armed body that, you know, is repressing, you know, counter-revolutionary forces. At that point, it's not, I don't see how you can call that a state anymore because it's, you know, capitalist state is so integrated with production and distribution. Well, I read this little state bit here then, Slavic, kind of to put this into a bit of context again. Yeah. Talking about the operational units, the GSW, the public commie kind of uh, worker consumption, they will be detached from the state and integrated into society. So the schools will be ripped from the control of the state, put into the control of society through the workers' councils. There will still be a state because the bourgeoisie has been defeated, but has not yet disappeared. But the state will then be clearly visible to all as the organ of repression of counter-revolution. But it will have nothing to do with production or distribution. Here, at the same time, the conditions will be present under which the state can actually die. Well, well, you can't get rid of the wage relationship until you introduce that working time calculation. And so if you have that wage relationship, then there is still a state that's kind of managing that social relationship. So once you impose the working time calculation, they say that the those are the conditions in which the state basically dies. And I just go a little further to say like, well, the state's already dead because it, it's about managing those social relations. And if those social relations are dead, then it doesn't really matter if you have a armed body for the repression of the bourgeoisie, that's not really a state anymore. So it's like, you know, it's like saying the invading army of a foreign imperial power is the state before they've even implemented the state. Like the uh, an armed body of men is not necessarily a state, right? Um, would you, yeah? Would you call like the workers' militias and such a, a state? I think that's I think that's kind of cheapening the meaning of the of a state oh, because exactly, we're yeah, yeah, we're talking about a re talking about something that's like managing a relationship, right? Uh, you don't have a capitalist society without a state in it. 
Okay, let's let's hit the final section then. I think we should probably, if we're being honest here, we should we should get Kielce back for the final final bit of reading here. Kielce, throw that hand up. <laughs> okay. F. Centralism, federalism. So, if we reject the notion that industry is centrally managed and controlled, that does not mean that we will be operating on a purely federal basis. Where the administration and control of production is the responsibility of the masses, there are undoubtedly strong federalist tendencies. From general social accounting, however, economic life is an uninterrupted whole, and we have a center from which production, although not controlled and managed, can undoubtedly be monitored. The fact that all transformations of human energies in operational life are recorded in one organism represents the highest summary of economic events. Whether we want to call it federalist or centralist, depends only on which side we see the same thing for from. It is both one and the other, which is why these terms have lost their meaning for the production process as a totality. The contrast between centralism and federalism was abolished in a higher entity. The organism of production becomes an organic unity. Well, I, I, I really like this kind of dialectical speak, and I really like it for how much it reminds me of the Stafford Beer cybernetic stuff. You know, this, <laughs> Kielce said he almost said orgasmic unity. I thought, it, yeah, I thought you were going there too. Let's be honest. The way your voice was going, Kielce. But uh, the, like this idea of the fetishization, typically on the Marxist left of centralization, this fetishization on the anarchist left of decentralization and federalism, it's the wrong question. The idea is how to synthesize, you know, an, a, a functioning organic whole, you know, and I think this idea of like this organ, this, this, the counting gy gyro unit of being a kind of a central, you know, a central element within which the decentral elements uh, manage, they, they coexist, the, 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 what would you say, you know, this ecology of like operational units and workers' councils with with centralizing elements but also decentralizing elements i i think is entirely the right approach to trying to uh have a viable you know like a vsm a viable system you know a a a viable organizational unit i i i really like this final section does anybody have any comments here before i i start getting too orgasmic myself chris yeah, I just wanted to say I really like this section as well because <laughs> those debates are are tiresome. I've had I've been to discussions where a lot of people would fall heavily on the side of centralization and not really understand what they're talking about. But uh, I think this really puts into perspective. We're not talking about you know some you know par party high command issuing orders from on high. You know, I I, I like the idea of a, a central monitor, right? That Again, the that's the sort of Birian way of looking at it, and and even you know presaged by what they're saying here. It's it's really incredible, and I I think we should just stick to this and put that stupid debate to rest. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, folks. Yeah, shut the, shut the fuck up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chris Chris has spoke now. Yes. Kilcher. I. I it, it's a running theme throughout this entire book that's been fascinating of this sort of superficially we have all these words that we use all the time that are kind of like superficially applicable to this this new this new way of organizing society but but actually come come with too much baggage and, and mean something different and, and yet we struggle to replace them with anything else and uh, i think we had the same discussion around profit and loss and surplus and deficit and a whole bunch of other sort of accounting economic terms and i think it's another great example of that and i, I think it's it's fascinating that there is something so fundamentally different, but 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 superficially similar about this whole this whole book to the way we we, we currently run our society that that just makes it really slippery to to wrestle with. And I, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, like this, I've just been reading the book on uh, Bertrand Oldman's before I came on the Dance of the Dialectic, and he was just like talking about about how people look at the outside forms. And like, even though the relations underneath the forms have, have been changed, you know, he's kind of criticizing, you know, academia and scientists and stuff. They look at these forms as the same. And like, 
you know, from a Marxist point of view, like we see that we have all these similar forms and we've got radically different relations underneath the underneath the hood. And I just think like this final section here, you know, it kind of gets to me, it gets across that idea, this kind of real kind of core part of Marx is about, you know, about relations. And, you know, this book is, if 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 anything it's doing, it's fundamentally changing the relations, right? But in reality, it's not really changing the forms, you know? It's leaving these capitalist forms there. You know, it's a fucking amazing thing. And, uh, you know, I think that there's, like something deeply beautiful about it you know it blew my mind when i read it first and it blows my mind to this day when you read a section like this final section right i think we'll leave it there for today and next week we'll do our our final read of 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 Matic introduction for the 1970 version i read it last night it's it's reasonably long i think it's about 4000 words so it will take us a full probably one and a half hours or something to go through. It's at least as long as one of these chapters, uh, one of the longer ones. But we did 17 chapters and 17 episodes. We amazingly kept it on schedule. We, did, we missed about two or three weeks, so we've done brilliantly. I'll see you all next week, and we'll, we can deal with Paul Matic, put him in a headlock and kick him in a dustbin. I'll let you go. Got to go do some rollerblading. I'll talk to you next week. <laughs>